Good morning. We welcome you to our nine o'clock worship service this morning. Thank you for being here to join in an hour of praise to our God through His Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. If you have not filled out an attendance card, I encourage you to do that. Uh, we'll have some gentlemen pick those up in just a few minutes. Uh, I'll encourage you to be sure you have one of the bulletins uh, they were handing out in the foyer and also in the front windows here. They have lots of news and information you're going to want to be aware of this week. And um, keep yourself an active part of the kingdom of God. <coughs> World events occasionally remind us of the... Um, Many, many truths in the Bible, and certainly we were reminded this week of the enmity between Ishmael and Israel this, this week, and um, in um, cruel acts of terrorism. I've, I've got a dear friend in Washington, D.C. who hasn't heard from his uh, niece or nephew in, in Israel, and that's not a good sign at this point. So it's, uh, I know it, it affects some of us closely. Uh, pray for, pray for peace, pray for peace. But our hearts are heavy for uh, the world when we see such hatred. You know, the only answer, as we know, is the Anointed One of Israel, the, the Messiah who he's, who, who uh, God sent, um, is the only solution to our personal problems and our personal salvation, and he's the only solution to peace. Uh, that's the only way we really know peace is through, through Jesus. It's, it's notable that in the Bible there were lots of righteous people. There were prophets, and there were priests, and there were kings, but only one human ever served as prophet, priest, and king, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ. And um, so we will focus on him this hour, all he has done for us. If you'd like to, let's stand as we begin our worship. You are Lord of creation and
Our Father in heaven, we are thankful for the blessing of this time we have to come on this morning to be together in fellowship with one another. We ask your blessings upon our prayers, our songs, our study of your word. We ask that our presence and our praise and our devotion will be a confession that we serve a risen Savior. Father, there are people among us and people in the world who need a special measure of your grace and love, and we know and faith that your will will be done. And we believe that you have the power to move mountains, as the scripture says, to do what is right. Father, be with each and every one of us. Give us strength and courage to do your will. And it's in thy son's name we pray. Amen.
This month, Ricky Pierce has focused on verbs associated with communion. And I did not get his crib notes today, but it's worth us considering. The entirety of what we do with communion is a verb. We commune together with each other in relationship that is deeper than other people understand. We commune together with our Savior at a feast prepared for us, those who do not deserve it. We commune together to glorify our Savior, to remember Him well, to be obedient to His commands each and every week. Truly a deep relationship. Truly all that we do in communion is action. Action in response to our Savior's command, hopefully with the right spirit. So, in thinking of that, and in thinking of the literalness of it, I came across a couple of verses from John that are important, that relate to what we're doing while we commune. John 6, 56. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. And John 6, 54, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. When we think on these things, we often focus on Christ's institution of the, of the supper. But to think about it in those terms gives deeper meaning to the verb to, for us to commune together. Again from Matthew. As they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Let us pray. Father, as we humbly gather around your table, may we fully commune with each other in deference, in awe, in magnification, in celebration of what you did for us. Father, we love you. Help us take this bread in a way that pleases you. Help us commune together as we partake of this bread. In Christ's name, amen.
Let us pray. Father, as we gather together to commune, to remember, to celebrate, to stand in awe, to be obedient, we pray, Father, that we recognize the magnitude of what your communion is, not only here in this place, not only here in this community, but the world over. We're especially thankful for a risen Savior who would give his blood for us. We know no way to express appropriately the depth of gratitude for that gift, the community of the people that are at your feast. We just pray that we approach it in a way, Father, that acknowledges and pleases you. In Christ's name. Father, we're blessed with so much, and at this time, we return a portion of the blessings that you blessed us with. That's it. This offering can go to the work of the church here in Fayetteville and around the world, and we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.
like your little stand as we sing. In my field, I would will sing with rain and truth. In the high for the high, I would bear and do. Spend my days in my friends of the journey through. Let me live for singing. This morning. If you've got a Bible, go ahead and open it to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. We're going to uh, spend some more time in the fifth lesson dealing with, with family time, but we're going to look today at where God started it all. And I think this is a foundational lesson that we need to be not only embracing, but we need to be sharing it, repeating it, teaching it to our children over and over and over and over again. Uh, we live in a very difficult world, a world that is very confused right now. And hearing us stand firm on what we believe concerning the beginning, the institution, the establishment, whatever words you want to use, the beginning of family. And, and I want to introduce in just a moment to you the first family. And we will look a little bit in Genesis 2 and walk away with some things that will be beneficial, hopefully. Uh, I want to mainly just communicate really two points this morning. I, I want to talk about how God, when He created the family, He created the family first and foremost uh, for, for one another to have a helper, a help me. You know, someone to help walk through this world with someone by your side. I realize there are people who are single, and I realize there are individuals who are not married and, and may possibly not get married, and that is okay. Uh, I think when we share lessons like this, we forget that factor in our assembly. And, uh, you know, God has created us for a purpose of sharing life together, but again, it doesn't mean that some don't want to share life with another. It just means that this particular point in time and Possibly throughout the remainder of their life, they've chosen to live single. There are some who have been married and uh, have lost their spouse. They understand the beauty of companionship and love, and, and they get it, uh, just as we get it. And so I don't want to overlook that segment today, but I also want to say that there are a lot of people, again, who are struggling in life with this idea of one man and one woman uh, and, and it's a real struggle. And I will tell you what we don't need to do. We don't need to take our Bibles and to hit people upside the head with it to make them believe what we believe. We don't need to be mean-spirited in our language. And we don't need to be harsh in how we approach people who don't believe like we believe. Like we believe in God and we believe in the family and we believe in one man and one woman. And we don't need to be unloving or unkind. What they need to see in us is the gospel lived out with our faith intact, you know, not compromising, but they need to see us loving. We claim to follow a Savior who was love, and we need to show Him to the world that might think differently. But while we want to love and want to encourage and want to do what we can to build people up to see the most holy faith that we believe in, we also don't want to compromise our faith. 
And so it's important for us to talk about these things and to, you know, repeat them over and over and over because at every angle, especially for our younger assembly today, they're being perplexed with a lot of different voices that are whispering into their ears that it doesn't have to be this way. That you don't really have to follow what the Bible says concerning one man, one woman, forever. And so I, I want to reassure you and I want to sound again the voice of God to say this is where it all began. And hopefully it will be a blessing to us. So let's begin reading this morning in Genesis chapter 2 verse 15. As we think about this particular part of Genesis 2, again, you might get a little more specific uh, address about the creation of the first couple, where just in chapter 1 you get more of a general. And here in chapter 2, Adam has already been created. And what I want to do beginning in verse 15 is share where God has given Adam a commandment to follow in the garden and then to see what happens thereafter. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat it, you shall surely die. Verse 18, And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called living creature, uh, each living creature, that was its name. And so Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, and to be every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not a helper comparable to him. Verse 21, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man, and said, This is now bone of my bone, bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh and they were both naked the man and his wife and were not ashamed what we see in that passage basically is the idea of being a helper and being a leader and I want us to see that because that is the way that God created it. When we deviate from that very thought, from this plan, and there are a lot of issues that we've talked about uh, recently on Sunday nights concerning uh, challenges of our day. Whether we're talking about leadership roles in the church or uh, as we spoke uh, a few uh, Sunday nights ago on abortion, or whether we're talking about what we believe concerning one man, one woman. Uh, we would be opposed to same-sex unions. Um, we, we see all of this right here in the beginning. And when we get this messed up, things change. As a matter of fact, they drastically change when Adam and Eve messed it up right here in, Acts, in Genesis chapter 2. And so I want us to think for a few moments as we think about this story. This is the beginning. You know, the book of Genesis is literally a book of beginnings. And while we might look at Genesis from an apologetic standpoint where we're going to present that we believe there is a God and that that God created the world and we're going to look at foundational principles for uh, understanding that we have a hope that burns within us and we want to be able to defend that hope, 1 Peter 3 verse 15, that we need to be willing to communicate our hope to people about what we believe concerning God and what we believe concerning His creation. The book of Genesis is a book of beginnings. But we don't look at the book of beginnings only considering the beginning of the world. We look at also the beginning of family. 
We see the fabric of society right here in Genesis chapter 2. It all started right here. And it was based on one man, one woman, procreating. Understanding that God was very specific with gender here. Understand that. I, I, I thought this was really interesting. At first, I didn't believe it. And someone told me, said, you, you know that, that when you're typing text and you're sending emojis, there is a pregnant man emoji now. How many of you knew that? Anyway, some of you knew. Okay, some of you had your hand up. I'm surprised. I did not know that until recently. But you realize biologically that cannot happen. Unless you have a uterus and ovaries, that's not going to happen. But our society is very confused, wouldn't you agree? That they're very confused because that, that is in the mindset of a lot of people now. Now, mind you, you and I more than likely understand how everything works and we believe in the foundation of Genesis for the family, the fabric of society. This is how God wanted the, the world to be populated. As a matter of fact... This is not only how, the world, uh, how God wanted the world to be populated. This was the plan by which his son Jesus would ultimately come into the world. And, and for us as Christians, we must embrace this plan. We're thankful for this plan. This plan ultimately produced for you and me salvation. You know, in just a couple of short months, it's hard to believe that we're embarking on December. We're going to be thinking about the birth of Jesus Christ in the month of December. It's hard to not appreciate the very plan that God established right here in the book of beginnings. To understand that this was the means by which, and when you follow that genealogy all the way down through to, to Joseph and Mary, royalty on both sides, understand this was the plan from the beginning. And that even in, when you get over into chapter 3 in the book of Genesis, when we talk about beginnings now, if you read Ephesians chapter 1 and you start to notice where Paul in Ephesians chapter 1 says that before God ever created the world, before he ever laid the foundation of the world, he had a plan to save the, the creation that he would make. Paul makes the claim. But what we see by way of beginnings is not only the beginning of the world, it's not only the beginning of the family, but in chapter 3, you see ultimately the beginning of the picture of salvation. That from that point forward until you reach Revelation, the end of your Bible, you will see that story unfold in such a beautiful way. But it all started right here. This was a part of the plan. When we think about a book of beginnings, we think about the beginning of family, we think about the beginning of, of a society... We think about the basis and foundation for a successful society, mind you. But let's look at firsts for just a moment. Can you remember some firsts in your life? Now, don't say it out loud because it might not be the person next to you, but can you remember your first kiss? Anyone? Yeah, some of you, you remember that. Your first job? I mean, that first paycheck that came with that first job, hallelujah for that, right? That's great. You remember your first car, your first home? What about your first child? First grandchild? That's pretty fun. You get the idea. First impressions. What about first impressions? Do you remember the first time you met that significant other? You stumbled all over yourself. You just want to make a great first impression. And she or he took you anyway, right? Even after all that. First impressions are beautiful. And they are important. What is your first impression, though, of the very first of impressions with Adam and Eve? Do you think perfect couple... None of the challenges that we face today, but you realize when we talk about firsts and we talk about first impressions and we talk about beginnings, this is the beginning of all of the challenges as well that you and I face today. Yeah, they were not a perfect couple, just like you and I are not perfect. But I think it's important to think about this couple for just a few moments. 
I mean, first love with Adam and Eve that was pure and lovely and in, in some ways wild and free. I mean, think about it. Their environment was a perfect environment. In the, it, it was in the innocence of the garden. No fear, no failures, no rejection. How beautiful would that be? It was a sinless, at the beginning, a sinless walk with God. No separation. Now, ultimately, you, you and I know the rest of this story, as Paul Harvey would say. We know what happened. And it didn't all stay that way. But just think about it in the beginning. Again, God chose this very means to ultimately bring salvation for this couple and for every couple that would follow thereafter through Jesus Christ. And so let's think about this for just a few moments. When we read that passage a moment, did you get the idea that God was creating for Adam a helper? As we think about this, number one, Adam needed Eve to help him. Are you helping your spouse? Are you helping your family to get ultimately to the one place that God was providing through this first couple and ultimately uh, the culmination of that in Jesus Christ? Are you helping your family to experience salvation in Jesus Christ? That's really the beauty of this picture. In those verses, in verses 14 through 25 in Genesis 2, we see that God looked around, and it wasn't that Adam was deserving of Eve, like Adam deserved something better. No, God, by His grace, gave Adam what he did not deserve in a wife. What a beautiful picture. And again, Eve was not created to lead Adam. That's not the picture that we get in Genesis. As a matter of fact, Paul uh, we'll talk about this as well. He will, he will re resort, uh, resort back to this passage in even dealing with uh, leadership issues. But sadly, Eve ends up going against her divinely created purpose. And she takes the leadership role. And as a result, everything falls apart. She listens to another voice. I will tell you today that there are many voices out there. Would you agree? Social media, the news. I mean, are there even magazines? Do people read magazines anymore? I mean, is that a, is that a current thing anymore? Just, I'm teasing, obviously. You're listening to a lot of different voices who are telling you this doesn't have to be the, that way. You can take the lead. If you don't want a man, you don't have to have a man. You can, you can go the opposite direction. Regardless of what the scriptures say, there are a lot of com competing voices. And as a matter of fact, our day in, in many respects is no different than Eve's day because there was a competing voice with her. As you get over into the Genesis account in chapter 3, that competing voice was a convincing one. I, I will tell you that um, while I am not a supporter of voices that are, that are competing with God's voice, and I'm not a supporter of voices that are contrary to God's plan. I will say I get it and I understand it. Because even in our own Bibles, we see a competing voice. And we see the very first couple struggling with those competing voices, that competing voice, and ultimately giving into that competing voice. But as a result, we see also the consequences of listening to a competing voice. Listening to a voice other than God's. Listening to a voice to try to take them in a different direction. Would you say that our world, our country, this state, this community is going in an opposite direction of God? I think we would agree with that. But right here in Genesis, we're seeing the same, very same thing. Only one voice. But what that one voice did was communicate to Eve that you can be a leader. Not necessarily a helper. But ultimately, the created purpose for Eve, and what we see her fulfilling in this decision is she became a hindrance to her husband. And that's, that's not what God created her for. That was not the purpose. 
Now, number two, I want you to understand, not only was Eve created to help Adam, but Adam was created to lead Eve. Did, did you catch that when we started reading in verse 14 of Genesis 2? Did you catch that before Adam, before Eve was ever created, who did God give the command not to eat of that one specific tree to? Adam. He gave it to Adam before Eve was ever created. And, and here is Adam's divine role. To lead his wife. To lead her in the right direction. To steer her away from those competing voices. To help her to see God. To see His grace. And to understand what God uh, wants from this first couple. And Adam failed in that. He did not fulfill his responsibility to lead his wife. She was a companion, a partner, a helper. And Adam was a leader. And instead of standing up and saying, Eve, as you get to chapter 3, God said, we shall not eat of this tree. Let's not listen to, listen to this competing voice. Adam remained silent throughout the whole process. Complete silence through the whole process. As the Hebrew would indicate in chapter 3, we kind of get the picture, and we've seen it in storybooks, right, that Eve is all by herself. And that's not the picture in the Hebrew language as Genesis 3 unfolds. They are both there together, standing side by side, he is speaking to not one, that is Satan, but to them. And rather than standing up and communicating God's affirmative voice, Adam also gives in and listens to a contrary voice. Guys, can I tell you that our responsibility is to protect our spouses? I, I will admit, sometimes I've not been the best at that. Maybe you're in that same boat as well. But that's what God expects from us. He expects from, for, from us to lead in a proper way. To, to lead in a way that, that, that steers them away from those contrary voices. That steers them toward the voice of God. The plan of God. But what happened right here in Genesis chapter 3, outside of the plan that we see in Genesis chapter 2, is we see Adam and Eve going in a different direction. And as a result, just a few moments ago when I said all of the struggles and challenges that you and I face started right there in Genesis 3, this is how they started when they flipped the script. When they followed a different plan. When they chose not to listen to God's word. And guys, so our job, our responsibility is to help lead our families toward salvation, toward Jesus Christ. To, to help steer them away from those contrary voices. And maybe this is the moment that we say we need to turn some of those voices off. And listen specifically to the voice of God. But nonetheless, right here, again, Paul uses this very example in 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning with verses 8 through 15. When dealing with the same challenges, the same leadership issues, he goes all the way back here and shows the breakdown of where it all started. He goes back to the beginning as well. The book of beginnings. And he talks about this beautiful, this beautiful plan. And Paul shows us that this plan was definitely one that Adam should have been leading his wife toward but did not. What should Adam have done in this process? What should he have said to his wife? Should he have pulled her aside and said, let's think about this. Let's talk to God. Let's see what God has to say. Maybe we're a little bit, maybe we've misunderstood in some way. Let's go back and let's reassess. Let's listen again to what God has to say. Let's just directly ask God. They had communion with God in the garden. But instead, they chose to act on their own initiative and do contrary to God's word. Number three, I think what we see in this beginning, this book of beginnings, this Genesis, this establishment of the family, this establishment of society. This is the picture of how it all began for the world. What, what we see is when we fail to follow God's plan, problems arise. Sin happens. And that's exactly what happened in this particular scenario. They listened to a contrary voice. 
they gave in. Eve took the uh, fruit, the forbidden fruit, gave it to her husband. He ate. He also sinned. And as a result, from this point forward, everything changed. God had created a perfect environment and this picture of perfection changed. And this was the beginning of it. We talk about beginnings. This is the very beginning of how spiritual death came. Separation from God. God drove them out of the garden. They're not able to experience life in the garden anymore. Everything changed. No access to that tree of life anymore. Everything changed as a result of this decision to listen to a different voice. Spiritual death came. That means that they would not experience eternal life with God from that point forward. Everything changed. They spiritually died. And everyone that's lived from that moment forward when they sin, Romans 3.23, all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Romans chapter. Six, we know that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. They would experience the wages of their sin. They would eternally be lost spiritually. As a matter of fact, Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20, the soul that sins shall surely die. And right here in their sin, in their breakdown of the divinely created purpose, the leadership that God established, The giving in to contrary voices, it all fell apart. Can I tell you that the demise of a society is when the family falls apart? Who do you think knew that in the beginning? God. That's why he created things the way that he did. Who else do you think knew that in the beginning? Satan. That's why his attack was on that very issue, that very establishment. And and as a result, what happens? When this first couple has their first children, you remember the story, Cain and Abel? You see the effects of their sin and not following God's plan, listening to contrary voices, ultimately affected their own family, where one of their children, one of their sons kills the other one. Yeah, once you get into chapter 4, you're seeing another first. It's just a book of first, one right after the other. But understand, when we follow what God says, everything works for the better. Everything follows the way that God would have us to do it. But right here, we see not only physical death, but as we ultimately see, we see, I mean, spiritual death, we ultimately see physical death as well. Something that that God did not want to happen in that perfect environment ultimately happened. That's why in chapter 3, right after the sin, you see the institution of this beautiful picture of salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. But I think number 4, there's always going to be contrary voices. When I said I get it a few moments ago, I understand it and you do as well. There, There are voices everywhere that are telling us to follow a different plan, to listen to a different uh, viewpoint, to hear a different way. And and I will tell you that unless it's God's and His way, it will not lead you to where you want to go and will not ultimately be a blessing for you and your family. If we learn anything from first impressions, let's get the first of first impressions from this couple. But before we're too hard on them, let's also remember that we too struggle. We all have sinned. It doesn't make sin okay. It doesn't put a stamp of approval on sin, but yet it does mean that we've sinned. The beautiful thing about today is that you and I are able to hear this story in the grace of Jesus Christ. We are able to see this picture of God and His plan. Ultimately, while Adam and Eve sinned and they made mistakes just like we do, we see the ultimate plan of God coming into fruition through Jesus Christ. Coming through this very means of of through this first couple and ultimately leading through to Joseph and Mary and Jesus and the cross and resurrection. See, it's not a, it's not a, just a a story that has a very hard and difficult ending. Well, Well, it does in one sense. But the story is wrapped in grace. God's grace is all over this story. 
And while we see the failures and the sins, and, and again, let's not be so critical about the sins of some and, and, and overlook our own. Let, let's be full of grace and love. Let's be committed to the plan. Let's stand firm on God's word and let's listen to his voice only, knowing that we're going to make mistakes, that we're going to need grace. I, I know some of you and you know me, it's going to take a lot of grace to get us to heaven. Amen. But that's the picture. A story that, that we see that is a beginning of failure that ultimately through the course of time ends in the beautiful picture of grace through resurrection in Jesus Christ. That's our story. Your story this morning, it, it might be littered with some sin. And I will tell you, there will be a contrary, voice, a contrary voice that will tell you to just give up. You're too broken. There's no hope. God doesn't have a plan for you. You can never be a, a part of this story of grace. And I will tell you, if you listen to that voice, you have listened to the wrong voice. Because if Calvary screams out anything, it says to the broken, as Mark led us a few moments ago, there is healing. There is grace in Jesus Christ. As we talk about plans, let's stand on the, the, uh, the plan of Calvary. Let's stand on the plan of grace from the cross of Jesus Christ. Let's give our hearts and our lives to Him. Let's, let's give our allegiance to Jesus and do the best that we can and, and rely on His grace and stand one day before God knowing that we are saved by the blood of Jesus. If you need to respond to Him this morning, we encourage you to do that as together we stand and as we stand. wanted me to invite you to his house this evening for a singing. So he said, invite everyone that wants to come. We're having a singing uh, at his house uh, tonight at 6 p.m. So you are officially invited. So this is a, a little bit of a day of invitation. So that's the first one. Um, the second one, uh, our son Justin and his uh, fiance Lauren are inviting you next Saturday uh, to join them in their wedding ceremony. Uh, that will take place here at Washington Street. Of course, they're limited on uh, well, the, the receptions at the Mimosa Community Center, and they're going to be limited on space there. So that part is by invitation only. Uh, but they said we want to invite. They wanted to invite their church family uh, to come and to celebrate with them next Saturday at six five thirty. At five thirty, did I get that right? Six five thirty. Which one? It's five thirty. Okay, five thirty. Yeah, I'm going to be there. I just. We'll wait till Saturday for them to tell me the time. But, but you need to know that first, so 5.30. Also, I want to say a quick thank you. Uh, there are a lot of things that happen in this building throughout the week, a lot of things that happen on our building and grounds. And I think we take a lot of it for granted. We just kind of expect certain things to happen and certain things to be prepared and, and to look nice. Uh, I, I know that through uh, this uh, spring and uh, and this summer we enjoyed uh, the beautiful flowers that are planted all around our facility. 
We have a group that actually takes care of those. They plant those. That, I mean, they're up here every day watering and, and weeding and, and, and trying to make this look beautiful. And I think we just kind of all take it for granted. It just looks great, and we just walk on, and we admire its beauty, and we forget to, to express our gratitude. But, but I will say that I am very appreciative to those people who are very disciplined and diligent to keep that up. It's, a, it's an ongoing job and to make that look great. So very appreciative. If you have a part, I'm going to embarrass them, if you have a part in making our flower grounds great, stand up. They're not going to stand up. Don, you're up front. You've got to stand up. Don in the back stood up. Miss Linda stood up. Miss Ann. We've got some younger ones that come up here too. Who, who, who is not standing up? Grab them and make them stand up. Y'all, let's give them a round of applause and, and, and appreciate their... Again, this is, this is just such a small thing, I think, to many of us, but it's a big thing to a group of people who take a lot of pride in making that look great, and I appreciate their hard work very much. Um, is that all the announcements we have? I think, Brother David, sorry for taking up your time. Good morning. Glad that you're... Uh with us here this morning, and I hope you've been blessed by being here during this time of worship and praise. And got a few announcements uh, as we close this morning. Uh, no one is currently in the hospital, at least on our list here. And also, congratulations to Hayden and Haley, or Hallie Dean, and the birth of their son, <laughs> Cooper Liam Dean, born on Monday, October 9th, weighing eight pounds, one ounce. Congratulations also to the proud grandparents, Charles and Christy Abernathy. Congratulations. Um, we've got one announcement about class today. Uh, Ricky Pierce's class will not meet today, so I encourage you to find another uh, classroom. There's a class that meets here. Andy Lyon teaches a class right around the corner, and there's, uh, I believe, Stacy teaches a class downstairs. I guess just find your way down there to the large classroom. Um, let's, uh, if you have a bulletin, I want to encourage you to take it at this time because I'm going to do something as we, as we close in prayer this morning, and I'm just going to read these names, but maybe if you see them for yourself in your own bulletin, uh, as, as we keep these people in mind, open it up to the inner, inner pages. And it, over on the right side of the right page there, it says continue in prayer, and it lists several names, about 20, 20 22 names or so. And as we pray this morning, let's, let's pray especially for these people and also for those uh, who recently lost loved ones, Skip Parks, recently lost his wife, and uh, also for those men who have been put forward as, as potential deacons who will hopefully be deacons very soon. So let's pray together as we close this morning. Our Father in heaven, we, we thank you so much for the, uh, the beauty of this time of year, the beauty in your creation. And the wisdom in your creation, and uh, as Charles talked about this morning, the, the wisdom in creating the family as you have done, the husband-wife relationship. Father, we, uh, as we marvel at your wisdom and we praise you, Father, we also come with hearts that are heavy at times and, and that uh, we, we want those who are our loved ones to be restored to their health or to at least be comforted in their lives. And we have several listed in our, uh, this morning we want to pray for. We, we want to continue to pray. And each one of these has struggles. And we pray for Linda Adcox, Ernest Barber, Cynthia Bates, and Troy Bates, Ann Bedingfield, Pat Bolin, Anthony Britton, and John Cowclaw, Owen uh, Gentry, Elaine McBride, Jimmy Mullins, Betty Pig, Bobby Poole, Ann Qualls, Sarah Roden, Jennifer Robertson, uh, Patrick Thompson, Ruby Walker, Jean Ward, Ida Flores West, Paul White, and I want to continue to pray for Skip uh, Parks as well. And, and Father, there are many others. This, this is just a, a list that we have in our bulletin, but we, we all know people who are struggling, that we encounter from time to time, and help Father each one of us to be good ministers and, and helpers to them.
Father, this morning as we uh, conclude our time here in this assembly, we pray that you'll be with us in our various classes, that each one of us can go and be blessed and be uh, an encouragement to others during this time. And Father, we ask again that you be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.